Leadership Marketing Department. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar this morning. I just want to remind you all that I am recording the event, so if you have to drop off early or you want to forward this to anybody to listen to later, I will send you a direct link to the recording and to the presentation tomorrow. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Pankaj Jain. He is our VP of Software Services. Pankaj? Thanks, Jill. Good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to today's exciting webinar. Uh, as Jill mentioned, uh, we are recording the webinar, and you're going to get the link tomorrow. Uh, just wanted to uh, uh, do quick uh, housekeeping for today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is uh, format is a little different. We will go through the entire webinar presentation first. Uh, uh, you keep uh, asking uh, questions uh, through the chat box or, or the questions in your uh, go to webinar window. I'm going to collect all the questions and we will uh, try to get to all of them towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so with that covered, let me introduce our speaker for today. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Amy Jo. Amy Jo is a world-renowned social game designer, community architect, and a startup coach. She has been named by Fortune as one of the top 10 influential women in games. Amy Jo pioneered the idea of applying game design and game thinking to digital services. Now over to you, Amy Jo. Amy, are you there? Thank yeah. you so much. Yes, I'm just unmuting myself. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, everyone, for showing up. I'm very excited to unlock the secrets of game thinking for you today. First, I want to make sure you're in the right place. Do you want to reduce churn? and engage your customers more deeply? Does that sound like you? Do you want to test your ideas on the right people and find product market fit as quickly as you can? Does that sound like you? Do you want better innovation outcomes for your team using a proven process that's based on real world success? If, if you relate to these statements, you are in the right place. I'm Amy Jo Kim, and as Pankaj said, I'm a game designer, startup coach, also an author and educator. I've worked on many products and with companies you've probably heard of. I help startups, game studios, and global brands build deep engagement from the ground up. That's the core of what I do. I've been able in my career to work on a diverse set of innovative worldwide hits. I helped bring eBay to life, the online marketplace, when it was still competing to even be acknowledged as something valid. I helped build Covet Fashion, a mobile fashion game that's become a major hit and has many extensions for its creator. I helped build Happify, a leading digital health app. Whoops, sorry. I help build Play, the online toy rental service, and also brought The Sims and Rock Band to life, working with those core teams from the very earliest days. I recently published Game Thinking, the book. You're going to hear about that today. Earlier, I published a book on community building on the web. And I teach game thinking at Stanford University and game design at the USC School of Cinematic Arts as an adjunct. The work I've done for major brands, including the New York Times, Disney, Netflix, Adobe, and Comcast, has led to core products for those companies. So I just told you about some of the teams I worked with who created breakthrough hits but I've also worked with many, many teams who didn't. They didn't cross the chasm to mainstream success. What's the difference? What's the difference between the teams that succeed and the ones that fail? Very often, it comes down to solving the right problem for the right people, not the solution that you build. 
There's something called the double diamond approach that's well used in design thinking. It actually came from the British Council of Designers in the 90s. And it's really how you innovate and bring a product to life. It's got an expansion phase where you do discovery and then a compression phase where you do definition, an expansion phase where you develop and a compression phase where you deliver. Design thinking, which you're probably familiar with, also uses this diverge, converge iteration to create successful products. The punchline of this is that so many of the teams that don't succeed don't spend enough time validating problem space. It's not the whole thing, but without that, you dramatically decrease your chances of success. What you're gonna hear about today is the game thinking process, which embraces this double diamond approach, but adds core framework for building long-term engagement, which is the differentiator. But you see here that game thinking also helps you first understand and validate your problem space, and then create a solution that's deeply connected to that problem and the people who have it. The first step is to hypothesize. This is where you articulate your strategy and you prioritize your assumptions. Linus Pauling, who's, one of, who's a Nobel winning scientist, says the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. This can be very counterintuitive when you think when you're in love with your idea, but the whole point is not to fall in love with your idea. How many of you have ever heard of stage gate theory? If you've heard of this, type yes or something else into the chat box. Stage gate theory is a well-established theory of corporate innovation. And the way this works is that at the earliest stage of innovation, you should have lots of competing ideas that are tiny. And then a kill gate so that the best ideas earn their resources over time and then another kill gate. So by the time you're ready to ship, you've got one or maybe two core ideas that you're developing down from many. Most of the successful, highly successful game studios and companies I've worked with do some form of this in a smart way, but the devil's in the details for how you succeed. So game thinking very much embraces this approach. The way you start is to plan your experiment. Every good experiment starts with clear hypotheses. This is a tool for generating clear hypotheses. This will save you many, many months of time and a lot of money. So let me show you how this works in practice to bring this alive. And by the way, this is covered in detail with step-by-step -step instructions in the Game Thinking Playbook. Cover Fashion is an evergreen hit game, but it didn't start out that way. It started out as an idea and a group of people struggling to see if we were crazy or if we could actually build something that would be successful. Here's the very first elevator pitch. We are developing a free-to-play mobile game based on real-world fashion to help fashion-loving gamers, that's who we thought we were targeting, play dress-up with designer clothes using our knowledge of free-to-play gaming and our existing female gamer audience. This is for Crowdstar. The idea was, the high-level pitch was, build your dream closet, collect designer clothes, dress up for imaginary gala events like walking the red carpet, and then build a lustworthy closet of stunning outfits. This idea came from initial research in what people wanted. We had an alternative idea, a parallel idea, which was really about discovering your own personal style, which would require more customization in the game. Are you glamorous? Are you trendsetting? Or are you understated and classic? Here's what our MVP canvas looked like right at the beginning of the project. And why I emphasize beginning is that this is a tool that you can use to track your ideas over time. And that's the most important thing. An MVP is a liquid, not a solid. It's not something you do once. It's an iterative process. So it's important to have tools that help you iterate. So what we thought was that our early customers were young women who play mobile fashion games. So that was our hypothesis. The unmet need we thought they had was aspirational dress up with designer fashion, plus maybe some celebrity stylist advice. We weren't sure of the mix there. The solution we had in mind is a free to play co-op game 
with real world fashion content, meaning fresh off the runway clothes. The value prop, which ties the solution to the need is a Vogue alternative that's about playing, not just looking. So something that would be like flipping through Vogue, but more interactive, more fun. The unfair advantage the team had, very important always to say, what is this team's unfair advantage? That keeps you focused. Was free to play gaming experience and also an existing addressable audience for fashion games. They had already built two fashion games, but they weren't hits, they were mediocre at best. So they had an audience, but they needed to do 100 times better. So that meant we weren't gonna go build an MMO or another kind of game. We were, this team had expertise in free to play gaming. So we were gonna keep there for our development. And then the early metrics we were tracking, early metrics are about when you've got 10 or 20 people, how are you gonna know if you're onto something? We were looking at like and dislike metrics via interviews. This all leads you to the key assumptions. And the key assumptions in this game, meaning what are the riskiest things that we need to test early, were one, that young women want a mobile game based on real world fashion. Do people even want that? One key assumption. Two, do people want access to a celebrity stylist? Is that a necessary component in the game? We were talking to Rachel Zoe, who you may know, and she wanted a million bucks to do it. And we were like, is it really worth it? Do, do we really need this? So we needed to get some early data if that was an important part of the mix. So that's how you do a quick MVP canvas. Again, all the instructions are in the book. And those key assumptions are the things that you want to test first to de-risk your project and be smart about innovating. Step two is empathize. This is where you identify your hot core customers and learn about their needs, habits, and frustrations. I cannot emphasize enough how much time this will save you because it'll transform your understanding of the problem space. Now there's some subtlety here, so let's get into it. Paul Buckheit runs Y Combinator. He knows a thing or two about startups. He likes to say, build something just a few people want, even if most people don't get it right away. This captures a key mistake that entrepreneurs make, and I see it again and again. They go after the mainstream too early when they're innovating. That is shooting yourself in the foot. What about you? Have you, looking back on your career, think about it. Have you ever listened to the wrong customers? If you think you have, type it into the chat box. I know I have. That's why I'm sharing this with you. It's because of all the mistakes. Finding the right customers can determine whether you thrive or fail. It's a high impact decision. Here's an innovative gaming platform called Siftio. We worked with them for several years. Awesome team, awesome company, awesome product. They didn't make it across the chasm. They found their high need early customers. It turned out for this particular platform, their high need early customers were special needs kid who had really sensory issues for whom a very tactile gaming platform had a lot of appeal. Most mainstream people thought it was interesting, but they really couldn't see why this platform was better than an iPad, especially at the price point. But there was an audience who needed it. They were small and they were very, very high need. The company decided they didn't want to go after it. They went mainstream, they went into Brookstone, they did a big ad campaign, and they're out of business now. Contrast it with Happify, an innovative mobile health game that became a huge evergreen hit. It's expanded, it's, go, it's consumer and in enterprise now. This game started as an idea from two brilliant entrepreneurs in the gaming industry to turn the science of happiness into a game. They had all these gamey ideas. We worked on finding our hot core early customers. It turned out it was Pinterest moms who had recently left the workforce and were very type A, but really wanted to nail being a mom. They had little kids. They were feeling a lack of a sense of meaning in their lives, a little bit blue. And they loved Pinterest. They weren't gamers. It was a hard pill to swallow, but we actually redesigned the app interface for that audience, that early audience. They got us started and the rest is history. So this is actually grounded in some pretty deep science. Let me walk you through it. In 1961, a scientist named Everett Rogers, who was working at Bell Labs, published Innovation Diffusion Theory which is a bell curve that shows you that 
the way innovation spreads in a given culture, whether it's pig farmers or tech or media or anything, the way that innovation spreads is through these groups. First, the innovators, and he defines it in a certain way, then early adopters, then early majority, then late majority, then laggards. Innovation does not ever start by reaching the early majority. It starts in that earlier group, your early market. Jeffrey Moore, 30 years later, wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm. Have you ever heard of this book? If you have, let us let me know in the chat box. So he wrote this book completely based on Everett Rogers' research data, which was drawn from many different industries, and used the same terminology, but introduced the idea of a chasm between your early market and your later market. He wrote this book about how he turned the Apple II hobbyist computer, which was a hobbyist hit in the early market, into a mainstream hit, aka crossing the chasm. So the punchline here is you have to start with your early market to delight and engage them, and then later go to your later market. It's very, very important. It's exactly what Paul Buckeye and Aaron Chesky of Airbnb and all these very smart entrepreneurs with arrows in their back tell you. Easier said than done. How do you find them? Who do you listen to? And even more importantly, who do you ignore? Okay, first of all, don't rely on friends and family. If you think, oh yeah, I know my early market, it's just my friends and family, that's going to lead you astray. They, they like you and you really need brutally honest feedback from impartial people. At the same time, don't just go after your main target market and find various people in there. That's not what you, that's not going to get you success if you're innovating. What you need to do is zero in on customer needs. Find a slice of your market that's burningly high need. And then think about who can I provide increasing value to over time with what I'm offering and who can also provide increasing value to me over time, both ways. That's who you want to go after. Those are you super fans. Okay, what does this look like boots on ground? First of all, we've developed a model and a set of techniques and templates called the super fan funnel to make it quick and easy to find these people and leverage them. The first thing is a very brief six, six question screener and you send it out to channels and it might be just talking to people, it might be a mailing list, it might be an internal database, it might be Craigslist, it might be Facebook ads. But you send it out to channels where you think, where your hypothesis of who you're targeting is. It's a very specific uh, layout and set of questions that are designed to surface the right issues. This is all described in the book. Then you run speed interviews. These are five to 10 minute screening interviews with a subset of those people. And then you take a subset of those people and you play test them. You might think, wow, that's a lot of work just to get a few people to play test my idea. It turns out this will save you huge amounts of time because you will get very clear, clean data from that subgroup you selected for play testing because they're carefully selected and they're calibrated. So let's see how successful innovators put this into practice. First of all, your super fans aren't generic early adopters, they're specific to your product. So on Rock Band, our super fans, when we were developing the game, when we didn't know if it was gonna be a hit, were rhythm action nerds, meaning people that had already played Guitar Hero, DDR, Dance Dance Revolution, and other games like that, who knew the basics. This made me crazy at the time because that's not who our target audience was, right? Our target audience was more casual gamers, but this is who we needed to help us bring the game to life early on. On The Sims, same thing. Our target audience was especially, it was women and men, especially women, casual gamers that would enjoy this kind of game. But early on when we were testing it, we had a group of about 100 hardcore simulation enthusiasts who really loved to make things. And these people helped us bring the game to life. On Play, we were targeting parents who want to rent toys for their kids, especially high-end toys for a weekend or a month. But we zeroed in on Lego-loving families who already enjoyed sharing photos on the site because we were building something and we wanted to talk to people who would be likely to want an environment that was based on sharing. On Covet Fashion, we actually pivoted. We thought we wanted our early adopters were going to be mobile fashion gamers, meaning 
young women who love fashion games and th identify as gamers. During our, in our research, we discovered that a much better target audience was mobile section fashionistas who didn't identify as gamers, but maybe they played Angry Birds, but they love social media, deep fashionistas, and they're always on their mobile phones. That was the perfect person for us. So let's dive in. How do we actually find them and identify them and leverage them? Our super fans. We started with a super fan screener, which we sent out and we wrote it to see if there were people who just really love fashion and consumed a lot of fashion content. That's who we were looking for. We then did speed interviews using Skype. You can use any tool. The people were all over the country. And we talked to them for five or 10 minutes to see one, if they would make a good research subject. And again, the book, the Game Thinking book details what that speed interview should look like. The other great thing about speed interviews is they're screening interviews. You don't pay people for them, you pay for the play test. But if you run 20 or 30 speed interviews, five to 10 minutes with people that you've selected, you are gonna surface habits and needs that are gonna help you even before you run a play test. It's incredibly valuable. Specifically on Covet Fashion, from the speed interviews, we learned that people really loved sharing their clothes with each other. Women love raiding each other's closets. They loved to get you know, one-on-one -on -one help getting dressed and they, some other things. And you, we use those existing habits to actually drive the alpha design of the game. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Punchline, if you wanna cross the chasm to success, start by capturing the hearts and minds of a small group of early adopters. And then you're setting yourself up to expand when ready to the early majority. So design, that's step three. Once you've done that and you've found those early, your early cohorts and you've, and you've listened to them enough that you've got some ideas about their habits and needs, now you're ready for design. So now you wanna sketch out how your customer experience evolves over time. Design can mean many things and we're not gonna get into all you know, graphics and sound and all the details of UX right now. We're talking about the most important core backbone of design for long-term engagement, which is evolution over time. The great Kathy Sierra likes to say, upgrade your user, not your product. That's the mindset we're talking about here. If you figure out how to make people some, get better at something they wanna get better at, you're on the road to success. A tool to help you do this is the mastery path. You've heard of customer journeys. This is a particular kind of customer journey. It's not a sales journey, it's a learning journey. It's a journey to mastery. Discovery is stage one. Discovery is where people are finding out about your project. We know what discovery is. What is this thing? Is it right for me? What's the value prop? That's what's on your user's mind. Onboarding is about just, you've made the commitment to try. How do I learn the ropes? How do I start giving and getting value? That's what's on your customer's mind. Habit building a stage very few people design for to their demerit. Habit building is your day 21, your day 30, your day 45 session experience. What pulls your customer back? What is your customer getting better at? What are they better at on day 30 than they were on day seven? And mastery. Mastery is not necessarily one stage, but it's a state of mind, and it's a way for you to think about leveraging your best customers. The, there's certain people in your user base, maybe it's two to 5%, they're gonna go really deep, they're gonna master your systems, they're gonna love what you're doing, and then they want more. The question there is, okay, what skills and knowledge and relationships has that person developed and mastered through using your product or playing your game? How can that person leverage those skills and knowledge to add value back to the ecosystem? That'll get you thinking about a compelling mastery path because the most important thing people want in the mastery stage is not rewards or status or anything. It's impact. Let's talk about Slack. Slack's a really interesting case study. I'll talk about the mastery path of Slack and later on we'll zoom in on the habit building phase. Talk about how you build a learning loop. The first stage is discovery and for Slack, they really went all in, especially early on, on social discovery. That's where you find out about something via your friends and colleagues versus finding out that something's been installed by IT. And in that sense, Slack is very game-like. It's more like Minecraft than, um, 
Salesforce. For onboarding, Slack did something very interesting structurally. Onboarding is via a friendly, helpful bot. Your first experience of Slack, which is a multi-user tool, is actually not a multi-user experience. It's a single player, player conversation with a bot who shows you the ropes. This is a trope from gaming. Think about it. Have you ever played or seen a friend play a game where there was a training level that was filled with bots? And then once you kind of knew the ropes and knew how to use your weapons and run around, et cetera, they'd release you into a multiplayer situation, say Counter-Strike. So those games are a more complex example, but Slack stripped that down and used the same structure to make great onboarding. Habit building in Slack is really all about getting better and better at making the tool your own. So what are you doing on day 21? Well, we'll talk about that when we talk about the learning loop. But the core thing is reading and responding to updates. And what Slack lets you do around that is customize it. You can customize your notifications. You can customize the way your interface looks. You can Customize the way you use emojis. If you own the channel, you can customize the greeting. You can even write your own bot, etc. Customization is Slack's through line in the way that a great narrative has a through line. And every great product has a through line too. Mastery in Slack is for in the deep enthusiasts. And the great thing about Slack and part of why it's so successful is that through line continues. You can go deep. Once you've got the basics of Slack, launch your own channel, program your own bot, even integrate your app into the Slack ecosystem. And now you can apply for funding in the Slack fund for apps in their ecosystem. It goes deeper and deeper. So if you want to build something people love and come back to again and again, create an experience that gets better as your customers become more skillful. So. What does this look like? Boots on ground. How do we actually do this? Let me tell you about a really powerful tool called Job Stories. This is covered in the book. I think it's in chapter four. And Job Story is a structure that is an alternative to personas, if you're familiar with that. It's action-oriented, filled with verbs, that really captures motivation and context of your customers. It's got this form here. When some trigger, I want to do some activity so I can get a desired outcome. Let me show you the job stories that we discovered as we were doing the Covet fashion research. And this tool is a great way to translate your research insights, particularly from discovery research, into product design. And building that bridge can be very tricky. The first pattern that we noticed in our research, and we saw this right from the speed interviews, we called the fashion browser pattern. Here's a quote that we heard like 25 versions of this quote. After a long day of work, I kick off my heels. Remember, these are fashionistas. They always have heels. And I just want to flop on the couch with my takeout. And if Harper's came, I'll look at that. If Vogue came, I'll look at that. Maybe I'll look at like this fashion blog on my iPad. And I just love to immerse myself in this world of fashion. I just wish it was more customized, more interactive, more about me. This is something we heard again and again. So we turn that into a habit story, which is just a job story built around a habit. Very, very powerful. This is a way to capture your customer habits and turn them into design input. When I get home after a long day of work, that's the trigger. I want to what activity? Kick off my heels and relax looking at high fashion outfits so I can. What's the desired outcome? Here's where it gets interesting. It turned out we learned in research these fashionistas think of themselves as being up to date. And so when they're looking at fashion magazines, they're not just zoning out, they're staying up to date on the latest fashions, they're educating themselves. That was a key insight. You'll see how that works out in a moment. We also found the co-creator pattern where you hear people saying, oh, my friend Patty told me to put this outfit together. I'd never think of it, I love it. I need her all the time. So we capture that with the story. When I need to dress for an important event, Trigger, I want to raid my friend's closet and get her advice, activity, so I can feel confident. That's the outcome they're looking for, increased confidence. It's very useful to surface that emotion and make it clear. It'll help you streamline and direct your design. The armchair stylist was the third pattern we found. This person wants to tell everybody else how to dress better. And the punchline is they really want to feel needed. 
So this person, when they give fashion feedback, that's the trigger, they want to know their feedback had an effect because the outcome they're looking for is to feel important and feel needed. I'll show you in a bit how those stories and those insights drove our product design and led to a hit. Now we're going to play test. Play testing, it's different than UX testing. UX testing is when you've pretty much built the stuff you want to build and you're testing, is this layout good? Do the buttons make sense? Is it understandable? Much earlier than that, however, closer to problem space, you can test your core ideas. Does, does this make sense? Does this flow make sense? Do people even want this thing? What, what, would it, what is happening on day 30? You can really play test and sketch that out. So you want to bring your core functionality to life by testing it with high need early customers with those people you spent time with empathizing. Dan Cook, a brilliant cooperative game designer and close colleague, likes to say, in a loop, you're learning a skill and updating your mental model. That's the thing that leads to player delight. We're going to come back to that. Keep that in your mind. You're probably thinking, okay, great. So I'm going to play test. What's the right MVP? What should I play test? How do I figure out what that stripped down MVP to get started with is? Well, is it a fake landing page? Fake landing page you've probably heard about from Lean Startup. Fake landing page can be great for testing your marketing message. That's your discovery phase. That's your marketing message. So if you want to test discovery, fake landing page, great. If you want to test your core product experience, not great. What about an operant conditioning or Skinner box? This is a loop where you're focused on tracking and rewarding behavior. Okay. And this is from uh, The Power of Habit by Charles Durig. The books Hooked by Neri All uses the same loop. And this approach is very, very popular. A lot of gamification is based on this style of approach, operant conditioning. And the punchline here is that this will get you short-term engagement and short-term lift. And there's times when you can use this as an element of a larger strategy, but it'll never lead you to player delight, thinking back to Dan Cook, and it won't drive long-term engagement. In fact, it often backfires. You want to pull in um, what's based self-determination theory is based on, which is intrinsic motivation. Things like autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Intrinsic motivation, the things that people naturally want to get better at, their own intrinsic motivation, is the backbone of any long-term engagement. Extrinsic motivation, if it's layered on top of that strong intrinsic core, can be helpful in keeping people focused. And it can lead to short-term engagement and totally backfire. The Game Thinking book goes into this in great detail with the science behind it. So the punchline here is the thing that you want is to make your customers more awesome, like Kathy Sierra says. And the way to do that is through skill building. Raph Koster, who wrote the preface to Game Thinking and is one of my closest friends, says fun is just another word for learning. Think about that. Let that marinate in your mind. Fun doesn't have to mean wow, wow, wow. Certainly it doesn't mean badges. Learning is one of the core intrinsic motivations. People like to improve at things they care about. Game designers call this finding the core bit of value, finding the fun. It's about building engagement from the inside out. And the learning loop, which is also covered in the book, which is how you bring that habit building phase to life, is the mechanics of how you actually do this. First thing is you want to identify your core social actions. I have this handy chart. And it, your core social actions will cluster around these kind of areas. We did this with Slack. I'm going over this quickly. It's, it's all the details are in the book. And we discovered that Slack's core social actions were really clustered around collaborating and self-expression with some exploration. Nothing in compete. That was intentional. Um, I did this exercise with the Slack team at their offices and a big fight broke out. A bunch of people internally wanted more leaderboards, wanted more competition, wanted it to be like that. Um, another group, including Stuart Butterfield, the CEO, wanted to make it very clear in the structure that it was a collaborative environment. He felt that that was the great strength. Very interesting decision. So when you look at a tool like Slack or any game, huge fights went into that game coming out and being successful. It wasn't obvious. Okay, so let's dive in. The first thing is a trigger and activity. The trigger is, remember those uh, job stories? It's some trigger, that internal ideally, that the person has. In Slack, it's FOMO. You want to check your updates. If your team works in Slack, it's like that's where it's going on. What do I need to check? 
And then the activity, the core activity is reading and responding to updates, just like Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, core activity. Then Slack gives you simple feedback. It turns out, okay, I've read everything I need to read. All messages read. It's such a simple thing, right? Yet Slack invested art time into making all these different cute little, hey, you've read everything. Why? Because it's such an important moment that you've read everything. It's connected to your whole experience, so they invested in it. So it's simple, but pleasurable and a little bit humorous feedback helps build the Slack brand. The third is some sense of progress that's connected to why you re-trigger when you come back. And that progress is all about customizations. Slack actually suggests that you customize your uh, notifications, which helps you um, get the right triggers so that you check the updates you want. So it's all connected pretty beautifully, that learning loop. So how do you actually build and test this learning loop? You can do um, mock-ups on a computer. You can do a mobile phone mock-ups. You could build hardware mock-ups. A lot of times people do that. Another thing you can do, which is covered in the Game Thinking book, is concept storyboards, even earlier than mock-ups, where you don't so much focus on the interface, mocking up the interface of your product, but you show people using your product over time. You don't even have to show the interface. And that can you can do that much earlier than the interface, and it can really help you tune your whole idea. That's a trick from gaming. So in the uh, Game Thinking book, I give you a template for a three-part playtest script that shows you what to do to warm up your, your test subjects, how to run through a testing artifact, and most importantly, how to debrief and get the most value from that test. And now it brings us to validating. To validate is when you distill your test results and then either recreate or for the first time, create your product roadmap. This really is about, I created a hypothesis, I ran through a test with the right people. Now I'm going to take those test results and create a new hypothesis. And I'm going to decide pivot or persevere. Test it. The earlier you can test your ideas, the better. And Frank Lloyd Wright likes to say, use an eraser on the drafting table or a sledgehammer on the construction site. Our goal here and what you can do with game thinking is spend more time on the drafting table so that when you're on the construction site, you're building the right thing. Let's put it all together. The Game Thinking Roadmap is built with the mastery path you just learned about put against our, our own journey as developers from MVP through alpha and beta, launch and expansion. Here's the punchline. Start here. Don't start with onboarding and discovery. If you put a lot of time in it, maybe you put a little bit of time into it. But if you just put a lot of time into it, you're building a leaky bucket because habit building is the much harder thing to do. And it's the way that you build engagement from the ground up from the inside out. So many people make this mistake. You're probably thinking right now, maybe a time you've made it. Start there, do just enough onboarding and then continue to develop that. But as you work to beta, you're going to want more onboarding, start to develop it more and just a little bit of discovery and then put your real effort into discovery for launch where you've got, now you've got a test and tuned onboarding and an even better habit loop, et cetera. That's how you build engagement from the ground up. How does this work in practice? On Rock Band, I work with that team from when it was an idea to when it shipped. We imagined out the whole Rockstar fantasy. We imagined it several different ways. But then we spent seven months tuning and iterating one single song. Oh my God, I was so sick of it at the end of those seven months. But until playing a single song felt kind of magical, we didn't build all the other stuff because that was the core loop. And frankly, the game wasn't going to get greenlit until that happened. We imagined the whole dollhouse come to life for The Sims early on. We imagined the journey. But then we spent about a year just doing tiny world building experiments, a lot of which were failures to find that magic finding the fun center. On Covet Fashion, we imagined cooperative dress-up game with real world hot off the runway fashions. But then we took what we learned from research and we piggybacked our ideas onto the customer's existing habits and actually built something much simpler than the first thing we imagined. And it turned out that was the hit. Well, here's a couple of the features. Now here's your punchline. Thank you for sticking around. Remember where we learned about the fashion browser and her needs? 
we put together a style feed, kind of like the Facebook feed, but with fresh styles so that she had something easy to browse through that was always the latest fashions as soon as she opened the app. For the co-creator, we put uh, a friend network and a shared closet into the app so that when you were collecting clothes and dressing up for an imaginary event, if you were friends with someone, you could raid their closet, borrow their cool shoes and put together an outfit and then they could get a notice that you had borrowed and see your outfit and comment on it. People just went nuts for that. And then we created this journey where you could discover your style, attend an aspirational event, browse your stream, and if you were really, really, really good, even make your own collection. We ended up scrapping the make your own collection as we learned along the way, but the point of making this journey isn't that you know exactly what you're gonna build, it's that it helps you understand and define your core systems. And here's the Covet Fashion Learning Loop. It includes the, the style feed, choosing an invitation, rating your friend's closet. This is all part of the core activity, dressing for an event, submitting your outfit that you spent all this time creating, which then, da-da, shows up in other people's style feeds and provides entertainment for them. And they can rate it, and those ratings bubble up the best content, plus pull you back to the app to see how your outfit was rated. That simple loop was the basis for a perennial hit. So how did we do it and how can you get some of that magic? Who do you listen to at what stage? Most people start by building something, testing it with your team, maybe your department. Then you do a friends and family test. Then you do a closed beta and hope that when you launch, it's to the early majority. But if you introduce super fan testing with a narrow slice of your incredibly high need community right at the start, the value you get will permeate through every other stage. So what can game thinking do to you for a recap? What can it do for you? This system can help you quickly create the right high learning MVP for exactly the right customers. It can help you build an experience from the start intentionally that people are gonna come back to again and again. And it can help you dramatically improve your innovation outcomes innovate more quickly and innovate smarter. So what you're doing is prototyping to learn. And the punchline is game thinking can help you not fall in love with an idea, but fall in love with solving a problem and learning iteratively from your customers. What game thinking gives you is the structure, techniques, and step-by-step -step instructions for how to do this. If you want more, go to GameThinking.io you can read about the book and buy it on Amazon. I'm thrilled to get it into your hands. Plus, for you, we are running a limited time special on the ebook. There's an ebook and a paper book starting right now. If you want to grab the ebook, you're curious about it, it's $199. Usually it's $999. That's a limited time offer. So I'll come back to this, um, but go to GameThinking.io to find out about it. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We'll be taking questions in a moment, but first, I'd like to introduce my wonderful host, Pankaj from CenterZip. Thanks, Emijo, for the great presentation. Uh, I encourage everyone to enter their questions in the chat box uh, while the questions are coming. We have some couple of great questions, which I'll ask, but let me quickly go over uh, some CenterZip slides. So I'm Pankaj Jain, I'm VP Software Services at Synerzip. I've uh, been with the company for almost three years. Uh, you have, here have my contact information. So if you have question, any questions about today's great webinar or about Synerzip, uh, please free uh, to contact me. Next slide, please. At Synerzip, we work with Azure a Trusted Core Development Partner for Agile Software Product Development. You get your own dedicated team of development and QA professionals. Uh, we help companies to accelerate uh, their road product roadmap by enabling them to scale the engineering teams quickly. We also help companies to address the technology skills gap uh, with this great uh, technology innovation uh, cycle we are in. The new technologies are coming faster than we have the skill. 
So a lot of companies come to us, whether it's the skills in gap, uh, whether it's in machine learning, blockchain, big data analytics, or just simply QA automation. So they look to us, so we try to help the company because we have over 500 people, development slash QA uh, uh, with expertise in all the new innovative uh, technologies. Obviously, the most effective thing is we help companies to uh, be more capital efficient by minimizing cost of their software development. Uh, with our dual share model, a uh, company at least save 50% cost savings. Next slide, please. As you can see, over 14 years, uh, we have over uh, 150 uh, clients with different domains using different cut, uh, cutting edge technologies. Our clients are all referenceable. Uh, they are long-term clients. We have clients who are from the uh, start of our company 14 years ago. And you can read our client testimonials on our website, synergy.com. Majority of our clients are small to medium-sized VC-backed companies. However, we do have large clients like Google and Dell. So we have like a whole spectrum of our clients. Next slide, please. Uh, you can connect with Synergip uh, via these social media channels, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Next slide, please. Uh, just want to announce our next webinar. This is a unique month of July. We have two webinars scheduled for this month. Uh, our next webinar is scheduled for July 25th, and it's a, a underestimated cost of microservices. So I encourage you to uh, register and attend the webinar. It will be a uh, exciting uh, webinar. So now coming back to questions, I see uh, uh, Amy, uh, you, a lot of questions are coming. So I'm going to start uh, uh, with the questions in the order they are coming. Uh, first question. I'm ready to answer. Pardon me? I'm ready to start answering. <laughs> yeah, people have been waiting to hear those answers. So first question came from Jorge. Uh, he's asking your opinion. Uh, he liked the slides where you talked about early adapters and crossing the chasm. So he wanted to ask, uh, what's your opinion? Is VR, virtual reality, reality is that now in chas uh, chasm or are you consider it early adapter? That's a really good question. I think it depends on which niche and which industry you're in. I think for general consumers, it's fairly early adopter and struggling mightily to get over the chasm and not quite there yet. I think in what I'm seeing is that in uh, uh, medical, I've seen some medical applications where it's getting more across the chasm. So uh, similarly with Google Glass, Google Glass, which is a huge failure as a um, consumer item, is really gaining traction in these very specific niches where it brings tremendous value. So it it, um, it really goes back to high need. When um, for VR, uh, they're seeing some results with like trauma, training people for PTSD and trauma, where uh, the results are good enough that people are using it more broadly. Uh, but the, the, the pressing need for VR just really isn't there for the consumer yet. That's what I see. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is asked by Jacob. He's asking, uh, what are the implications of the social actions you choose? Should you only aim for three social actions or can you have all four or even just two? What a great question. So it depends on the complexity of what you're building and it depends on your stage of development. Early on, when you're focused on building a streamlined MVP. And when you're testing your early core ideas to find that nugget of value, right? That nugget of need, it's very important to not have your social actions be in all of the, um, all of the quadrants. Uh, it's a very common mistake I pe see people made. They go, okay, we wanna have stuff for competitive and stuff for collaborative and exploring and expressing, it's all good, shove it all in there. The reason that that will, then you don't have, remember when I use the term coherent through line, the social action matrix is a tool that can help you focus on having a coherent through line. So what you wanna do is say, 
if we had to strip out so much out of our product that it hurt us physically to do it and just have this nugget of the most basic value where, you know, if you were even thinking maybe they don't need that or that would be great, but you just want to have that basic value, what are the social actions then? And you want to understand what your North Star is. In other words, is this do so a good way to do it is to ask yourself is the environment that i'm building in my application is especially if it's a social environment because this is most applicable for tools where people somehow interact with each other or a situation because cooperating and competing right yeah. so but you could apply it to you know your relationship to the machine i suppose anyway what you want to do is say are we fundamentally building um, an offering that is organized around people collaborating together towards a shared goal? Or are we fundamentally building something that's organized around people competing for a limited resource? Those are pretty different things. And what I've seen is hits, the best products, usually are their core structure is organized around one or the other. And then for express and explore, again, is the most central activity that people are going to do exploration or is it self-expression in some form and if you had to weight them which one is most important as you saw slack had a lot in collaboration a lot in self-expression and just a couple in exploration that's a pretty good mix but what i want to point out is slack slack didn't start out at their mvp with all those actions their mvp had a smaller set of actions but they were still in those quadrants so don't try to fill out all the quadrants. Try to find where your North Star quadrants are and try and really flesh that out and test that. That's a much stronger approach. Great. Thanks. There are many questions. Uh, next question uh, is asked by Florence. Uh, she's asking, should early stage startups go through this process when resources are scarce and founders are keen to get to the market quickly? Interesting question. Yeah, it's a great question. I had a conversation with a startup CEO about this exact issue yesterday. Um, and she's struggling. She's a startup CEO. And they got their product to market very quickly. And it's kind, it's a leaky bucket. The very leaky bucket. And she's thinking herself because she read my book and she went, oh my God, I built a leaky bucket step by step. So I think that um, there's a couple of things. One, it's super common and there's a lot of pressure to get to market and there's a lot of people in the world. I mean, look, you can get advice from so many different people and that are brilliant and succeeded that will contradict each other, right? Um, the It is important to get to market and putting your product in the app store is one way to get feedback. Okay, so there's a lot of pressure to get it out there, get it out there, get some feedback in the app store. Sometimes that's the right thing to do. Sometimes the right thing to do is to do some research earlier and some work in the problem space to make sure one, you're solving the right problem and two, you're getting your feedback from the right people. And that's what the game thinking system does for you. And what I found, and then you have the question of, okay, well, how do I convince my stakeholders that's the right thing? So two, I have two answers for that. One is part of why I've worked so hard to create shortcuts is there's incredible pressure on entrepreneurs, myself included. I'm an entrepreneur too. There's incredible pressure to get stuff to market. I mean, it, it's like, it's so important. So I know how to do a three month ethnographic study, but I'm not going to do one if I'm trying to get to market, you know? It's like, what can I do in a week or two that gives me 80% of the insight from doing a three month? Like, that's what this book is full of. So one, one part of the answer is, I've worked really hard to give you proven shortcuts that I use with my clients to make this discovery phase where you're figuring out what you're gonna put in the app store, right? Go much faster and let you be smarter about using your time and your resources. The second answer is with stakeholders, um, a lot of times what my clients have me do is they'll have their stakeholders come to a webinar like this or they'll arrange an internal workshop or things like that and they'll use my materials or my coaching to educate their stakeholders. 
and to walk them through a case study of a company that did exactly what they're telling the startup to do and failed and why. Okay. And that can be very convincing as well. But Thanks. the most convincing thing is to go ahead and do some early research and get some results and then go, look, we got these results and the results are saying, you know, going to tell you how to save time and money. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, next question is asked by uh, Prasad. He's asking, is it good? He likes the, the, the concept you mentioned about super friend and he's asking, is it good idea to start with your good close friends for uh, your initial feedback uh, when you are thinking of about your idea? No. So I'm, I'm very clear about that answer, but let me give it some nuance. If you are getting something to bringing something to life and your close friends are your target market. Let's say all your close friends are IT developers and you're building a tool for IT developers. Then, you know, maybe you get some feedback from them, but it's critical, critical, critical that you also treat that as one cohort, put it aside and find another cohort of people that do not know you, that fit your early adopters. You will get skewed research every time from your friends. Even if they try not to, they want you to succeed. They're your friends and they're always going to give you good research. So it's important you have at least another cohort that you don't know that are very dispassionate and just have a need and are only interested in if you're thinking fill their need to compare to your friend's feedback. Great, great answer. Uh, next question is, uh, uh, Michelle is asking, uh, she has gone through uh, Lean UX design and agile methodologies and this is the first time she is uh, taking game thinking and she can, can you speak a little bit uh, more uh, image about in your experience, like what's the difference key takeaways uh, from Lean UX design methodologies and game thinking? so that people can grasp the idea. Another great question. So a lot of game thinking embraces Lean UX very much. In Lean UX, there's a lot of emphasis on quick discovery research, a lot of emphasis on um, you know, iterative prototyping. So that, and that's absolutely here in game thinking. I embrace it. You see that in design thinking as well. The key differences in game thinking, there's really three. So I want you to remember these three words, super fans, mastery path, learning loop. Key difference number one is the methodology and the focus on finding a slice of super fans. Most lean UX research does not do that. They might suggest it, but they don't tell you how to do it and they don't you know, make it clear that that's where you should start. So the, the super fan concept is extremely powerful. That The one that's based on innovation, innovation diffusion theory. Um, the second thing is the mastery path. Lean UX is not, does not have the concept of building your experience around a path to mastery that your customer is on. So that's the second key uh, technique that's different, but very integrated with and complementary to all the Lean UX methods. The third technique is the learning loop and the learning loop and again it's covered in detail in the book is a very powerful approach that and then the learning loop and the game thinking um excuse me uh let me go back to that slide the game thinking uh roadmap really has all of these together and i think that's really helpful for you to think about okay what are these so it doesn't have the super fans on it but here's your mastery path, right? And then here's your learning loop start. So the idea, the process idea that for your MVP, you don't start by building fancy onboarding that impresses your VCs. You start by bringing that habit building loop to life, bringing that learning loop to life and framing it as a learning loop, not as an operant conditioning loop, not as track and reward behavior, but this is the mechanism whereby your customer becomes more awesome and gets better at the thing they care about. So those are the key differences. And they and thank you for that question because it's an excellent question. 
Great, thanks. Uh, one comment I see uh, from Eric, he says he already owns the book and have read it. It's awesome. So he's asking everybody to, he's encouraging everybody to read the Game Thinking book. Uh, so just wanted to pass it by you, Amy Jo. Wow, uh, I, Eric is someone with such good taste. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. I wrote it for people like you to help you. So I'm so glad it's helping you. And I think, uh, so I think we are pretty much towards the uh, uh, end of our time. So uh, I wanted to thank you again, Emilio, for a great presentation. This has been a, uh, one of very unique uh, webinars uh, at Synergy. I'm sure uh, we will have very many follow-up questions. So I, I encourage everyone, if you have questions, as I said before, on the today's presentation or about Synergy, please do reach out to us uh, or me personally. I'm looking forward to seeing you all in the future. And with that, thanks and have a great day, everyone. And that's it.